So I have a random question for you, but I'm curious. Is it true that a Nobel Prize winner thought that aliens might have created life? Yeah. So not just a Nobel Prize winner, but one of the two people who is credited with discovering DNA itself. Welcome back to The Science Dilemma. Today's conversation is with none other than Dr. Berkeley Greider. He is a chemist who retrained as a molecular biologist and computer scientist. His work spans from cancer research, RNA biology, scientific design. We'll talk about materialism, Francis Crick's alien theory. We're gonna discuss and we're gonna dive into the deeper assumptions behind modern science. So let's dive in. Dr. Greider, thank you so much for joining us on The Science Dilemma podcast. Happy to be here, man. This is exciting. What's the difference between design and lucky accidents? Well, it's easy to spot when something is designed. You know, when you have a careful organization of, of parts, you know, like if you're on the beach and you see, you know, Johnny loves Sally and a giant heart around it, like etched out of the sand, you know, that wasn't created by wind and erosion turtles walking, you know, there's lots of patterning and ordering in nature that can arise naturally. But then when you see something designed, it's like, it's not just a, like a fractal array or, um, you know, it's got exquisite sort of different parts placed in particular relation to one another. But the key mark of design is that it's for a function or a purpose. With then the conversation of today, like modern world, sophisticated language that we would call, you know, computer code or software, how, how sophisticated is DNA comparatively to that? The famous Bill Gates, you know, said that DNA is far more complicated and sophisticated than any computer code ever written. And he would know. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it's more sophisticated in, in a number of ways. You know, first of all, like the same DNA that started out as a single cell is able to create not only many different kinds of cells, but an entire organism where there are multiple layers of cells all communicating together. Computer code can't do that. It replicate like it is a physical entity that is living and reproducing growing and communicating it's that that's remarkable in part because of the scale dna is much smaller than people realize how um, small is it so it's roughly two nanometers which is a, a number that people yeah we wouldn't under, even understand you can pack for you know so there are 3.2 billion base pairs that are unique and there's two copies of that so 6.4 billion base pairs of information in the dna code and it's packed in something so small you cannot see it with the naked eye. You, you have to have a microscope to actually observe a nucleus. And that amount of data compaction is something that modern technology has not even come close to. And the fact that it's so tiny, so compact, so rich with information. It's also one of the things that computer code doesn't do, but that DNA does do, is it has multiple overlapping codes. So with the idea of common descent, with your understanding of genetics and mutations and the lack of creative power of mutations. I mean, I know that you have some good stuff on common descent, how it just wouldn't line up. Could you explain some of that to us? Yeah, I mean, I think the fact of the matter is that we are losing DNA information. Every species is losing DNA information through mutations. You know, I say we get like thousands of mutations that cause death. Thankfully, we only pass on like 100, maybe 300 mutations to our children, but that still causes a loss of information over time. Time doesn't come to the rescue for common descent because the very process that is supposed to be able to come up with new body parts, new genes, new functions over a very long period of time, well, time is not, is not the friend of upward evolution, it's the enemy. Because what we observe is that over time, we are losing information rather quickly. Um, on, on, especially if you stretch out to longer time spans, and the gain of information isn't, not only is it difficult to observe because it's super rare um, for anything that's actually beneficial, I don't know anything that's, that's genuinely creative. And so you're losing information, you're not really generating and creating new information. That's just the nature of the process. And so you can't, like there's just no mechanism um, with mutations adding up every generation, are we getting better or worse as a species? Like, what does that, what does that look like for us? Well, we're getting worse as a, as a species. This is something, something that's been documented by Michael Lynch. He's not a 
creationist. He's a evolutionary population geneticist. And, and he just documents that the human genome like is degrading and there's, there's no proper purifying selection. Meaning like the first thing, one thing evolution does do is it weeds out bad mutations that are really bad. Oh, okay. So purifying selection is the primary motives of natural selection. It's like taking out the bad stuff that, you know, it's, it's weeding out the mutations. So it's funny, right? That yeah. evolution yeah. is supposed to occur via natural selection, but natural selection's primary job that it's actually doing is to remove mutations from the population. Add. Not add them. Yeah. I was looking some stuff up. What's how Dane's, hopefully I'm saying that right. How Dane's dilemma. And is it, is it as bad as it sounds? In order to actually fix a mutation to like add it to the genome population wide, you actually have to get that mutation from one individual to the whole population. And this really limits how fast evolution could even occur. Even if you have a beneficial mutation to actually get it fix in an entire population. So that really slows down the speed of, of how fast mutations plus natural selection could even create significant change. That's, that's a difficulty that's often not like given much attention. It's often kind of brushed over. What is junk DNA? Cause a lot of people have no idea what junk DNA is. And why do some scientists, I don't know, do scientists still think that it's useless? Some may, the term, the term has really fallen out of favor. You know, I remember when I was doing my postdoc at the NIH, um, a, a seasoned career scientist who had retired from his own lab, who was kind of hanging out in our lab, talked to me about junk DNA and just was like chuckling about, about it as, as I was describing my work on epigenetics and where all the non-coding DNA is, is doing all these cool things. He was like, I can't believe we used to call it junk because that's where all the interesting things are happening. I mean, the, the differences between cells between cell types, the difference between a muscle cell and brain cell is how the junk DNA is being used differently. So, and so junk DNA was basically, they believed that that part of the genome wasn't functioning or functional or that was useless information. Yeah, it was, well, we didn't have a function for it. Gotcha. We didn't know what it was doing, but we did know it did not code for amino acids and proteins. Mm -hmm. It is remarkable that 98% of the genome does not actually code a protein. That's that insane. The central dogma is that DNA makes RNA makes protein. And that's like what the genome does. Now, certainly that's a central, if uh, that's of, uh, that's of central importance to biology, but it's 2%, but it's 2% coding. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. And so in books written by famous atheists, you know, they loved, they love to go after junk DNA. It's like one of the best evidences against design, which is a decent argument, I suppose. You know, why would God litter the genome with all this non-functional stuff? An intelligent creator would not do that. Uh, but now we know that it's very functional. The remarkable thing is that we're learning new functions all the time. There are so many things that we, you know, the pseudogenes and non-coding RNA, the ability to, you know, for the non-coding DNA to instruct how DNA is folding in three dimensions. It creates this elaborate, well-organized, it seems like chaos, but it's actually very well, well-organized information, you know, closing off. I think of it as a library where it's like, it's a self-organizing library where it takes out the books that it needs and it, it packs away and closes off and, and, and can, you know, isolates the books that it doesn't need. It's, it's a remarkable three-dimensional feat. And all of that is really encoded, informationally encoded and the non-coding DNA. So there's these non-protein coding codes, there are many of them that we're learning about. I'm sure there's, I'm sure in 10 years, we're gonna know even more, and it's gonna be even more function, even more elegance, even more interconnectedness of this supercomputer that we call the human genome. But what's the weirdest thing that you've ever discovered like within your research, both professionally, or if you were just like doing research as a science person that's just enjoying the, the world of science? It was really, I would say, a big shock, not only to me, but to many, to learn that the organization and the motion and the movement of proteins and DNA and RNA is governed by the same principles or those same physics that cause oil droplets to form when you put oil in water. That kind of the different liquids can separate 
into different into distinct bubbles and that that process underlies the organization of many 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 distinct uh little compartments of biochemical functioning in cells that was a that was a shock like that was like I, I didn't see that coming i mean i was for a long time wondering how how is it that things can be so well timed and organized like it you see these animations of the dna and the rna right like things are moving and everything's going to the right place at the right time and it's like happening so fast and none of those animations capture how fast these things actually work there's they're super super oh because they're extremely slowed down just so that we can understand and perceive yeah. it yeah yeah so biology works with precision and speed so i was kind of imagining like what could be the mechanism for this like invisible hand that's causing things to go in the right place at the right time um, so efficiently? What would you say to Christian teens on why they should care about DNA and intelligent design? Fundamentally, it depends on understanding why are we here? You know, I think a lot of like to live life adrift without a sense of purpose is just not worth living. It's not only that, it's dangerous. If, if you're drifting without a sense of why am I here in a purpose, um, you're just robbed of, of so many things that, that we're, that we're supposed to have I and mean, we're supposed to, you know, get motivation and, and meaning out of life and a sense of purpose ultimately doesn't really exist if we aren't created, but if we were created for a purpose, then, then that's exciting. Why am I like, why am I here? Why was I made? Like, why can I think and talk, move and love? So that, that's to me, like the number one reason for those who are more perhaps interested in science or pursuing a career in science, I would say it's about being a critical thinker. Science is historically exciting because we're able to question everything. We're able to think outside the, the box. We're able to challenge, you know, every authority, every so-called authority we could say, no, I, I'm going to look at the data and mm. I'm going to use rationality. And I'm going to build up explanatory power to make sense of everything around me. So thinking carefully and really diving deep into understanding various topics, let's say like, even if you don't see, like, even if intelligent design sounds like a non-scientific thing, I would say. Yeah, like a pseudoscience to people or whatever. Call it a pseudoscience. I'm, I'm telling you, it will, studying the arguments on both sides of this and diving deep into the mechanisms for anyone who's actually interested in understanding science, like it's going to help you understand biology better. Even just the exercise of understanding someone you disagree with and understanding their argument helps you be a better critical thinker. And so if somebody doesn't agree with intelligent design, but still having respect, something we don't often see in the comment section, and learning how to just say, hey, I can see from your vantage point, I disagree for these reasons, but at least I'm giving you the opportunity to explain yourself, which is so cool for science that <laughs> what I heard from you is basically if a teenager wants to be a rebel and go against authority, they should just become a scientist because you're allowed to question everybody. Yeah. I mean, that's how science progresses. Every junk forward in science is a breaking of the old ways of thinking. And it's respected. Like you're supposed to yeah. do that. Yeah. That's, that, that's your job. Good yeah. scientist challenge past paradigms and the things i'm most proud of are old paradigms that i broke what's something that you wish every teenager did know or understand about biology i think it's important to have the basic understanding even if you don't know the details everything that's occurring in our cells is very much like a like the supercomputer so all the features of a computer your 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 hard drive that stores the information the ram the random access memory system um you know, the CPUs and the GPUs and all of the logic circuits um, and, and even the software code that's written at multiple levels, all of that, that that we have seen in computers, like there's a direct comparison. There's an example of each of those that already exist inside your cells. You are made up of little tiny supercomputers, but we're made up. That's insane. Yeah. You know, and, and the analogies are very good. There's a reason why... Um, when we teach this stuff, when we teach biology, we, we often teach by analogy to computing systems because it's the best analogy. 
it fits most closely. Like the reality of what biology is, is best explained through analogy to his computing world, both in a hardware and software sense. So I have a random question for you, but I'm curious, is it true that a Nobel Prize winner thought that aliens might have created life? Yeah. So not just a Nobel Prize winner, but one of the two people who is credited with d discovering DNA itself. So Francis Crick, the famous Watson Crick team, wrote in a book called Life Itself that, and I quote, what is so frustrating is that it seems almost impossible to give any numerical value to the probability of what seems a rather unlikely sequence of events. You know, he's talking about the, the magic of DNA and its content. So he goes on to speculate that because this information is so rich, it requires some intelligence, but God's not allowed. He doesn't think, but, <laughs> but he speculates that aliens actually created this DNA information and, and created life. It's a reasonable conclusion if you're not allowed to invoke God, but you do need to invoke some intelligent cause to explain life and the DNA content in particular. So of course that doesn't solve the problem. It just pushes it to a different planet. Yeah. You know, Cause then the question is who created the alien? Right. Cause we're going to yeah. they are also built with, you know, these miraculous molecular machines of some sort or another, even if they didn't have DNA. I mean, I feel like I've gotten a masterclass on intelligent design just from this conversation. Well, this was fun. You asked good questions. <laughs> Appreciate you. Well, thank you for joining us, Berkeley. Absolutely, man. Thanks so much.